Hello and welcome to the final session of ICAC Live coming to you from San Francisco, California at the 2012 ICAC meeting. ICAC is the annual infectious diseases meeting of the American Society for Microbiology. And I'm your host uh, during this session and some of the others. I'm Jeffrey Fox, the features editor of Microbe, which is the monthly magazine of ASM. In this session, I'm, uh, my guest is John Brownstein of Harvard Medical School in Boston. And he and I will be talking about uh, the, the emerging role of social media for public health, um, but in public health, sorry. Before we be begin, I want to remind people who are following us on the web that you can ask questions via Twitter using hashtag ICAC, and you can also send questions by using the at sign ASM Newsroom. And for those of you in the room, and we insist on you joining us and asking questions, raise your hand, someone will bring you a microphone, and uh, please identify yourself uh, by name and, and affiliation, and then fire away with your question. All right, with that, that introduction completed, I'm going to ask John to give a, an overview, mm -hmm. summary of, of his, his activities. I guess mm -hmm. it's, you don't have a study to, to share with us. This is yeah. going to be more an approach. Mm -hmm. uh, so go ahead. Yeah, so the, the broad area of work that uh, our group is involved in is this area, what we call digital disease detection. So the concept of harnessing the web from the point of view of, of gleaning something about population health uh, from online communications. Um, the concept isn't very new. It's actually the idea of internet monitoring has been going on for the last 10 years. Um, a system called ProMed is a social networking site for infectious disease experts to communicate information. That was essentially the first infectious disease social network. And that's communicated incredible amounts of information, um, information that goes outside of traditional public health efforts. And we've shown that from this system and actually systems like the Global Public Health Intelligence Network out of Canada, that mining the web and communications around the web can provide early insight into epidemics, pandemics around the world. So for instance, the first reports of SARS didn't come out of official government reports, but actually came out of informal communications and news media reports. And since the time of SARS, we've had an explosion in the use of internet, uh, internet social uh, media, uh, Facebook, Twitter, um, the news, online news media has grown. And so there's become an even increasingly uh, important opportunity to harness those communications for the point of view of early detection. And that's really where our work is focused on. How do we organize the massive amounts of content that you find online to say something interesting or to say something about population health and provide potentially early detection of disease threats? And that's why we developed the Health Map System, which is this online tool that organizes all the world's content on emerging public health threats, filters and organizes and categorizes and maps that data and filters that and sends that to uh, public health departments around the world, but also uh, the, the community at large. And so that, our goal has been twofold. One, to provide early detection of disease threats, but also build awareness in um, the general population around emerging threats in a way that provides a unique view that hasn't been done before. And that's really been the focus of our work. OK, you, you shared with us the example of SARS. Mm -hmm. Do you have any more recent examples where this system has picked up on outbreaks in interesting ways and delivered that information in, in, you know, to, to somebody's benefit. Absolutely. And there's been a lot of uh, efforts, you know, ours and many other groups that have explored and validated the use of this, uh, these types of information tools, the communications that exist on Twitter, what people search for online, news media. Um, and there's a number of examples. From our own research, we were actually able to show that the first reports that came out of H1N1 didn't actually come out of official uh, government reports out of Mexico or the US, but actually came out of local news media stations talking about a mysterious illness that was emerging in Mexico at the time in, in April. 
And um, there's been more recent examples. We've been able to show that, for instance, Twitter usage in Haiti actually was able to provide a, a simulated epidemic curve for the emergence of cholera um, in a way that we could estimate the transmissibility of this strain um, with data that was available in real time rather than relying on official sources. But even from the point of view of providing awareness on, it, on outbreaks that are potentially not reported through official channels, it's providing a day-to-day -day view on events that are happening. So for instance, our view on, on foodborne outbreaks is, you know, is very narrow when we think about the official reporting, but when we look at health map and the data that's coming through all these different channels, you can see that the burden of these outbreaks is far exceeding anything that's, that's being reported out of, out of official sources. Well, that's, that's often what's uh, said about foodborne illnesses, that they're the the burden is much greater than, than shows up in official statistics. I, let's, I don't know, I hate to use that word, but let's get a little granular. Can you share a, mm -hmm. a, an example? I, we, in an earlier session, we were talking about uh, H3N2 influenza and mm -hmm. how the numbers at this point mm -hmm. are right about 300 yeah. total for, for this right. calendar year. Uh, is that something that you see or, it, or people may not recognize they have the flu, so how do you know that any measure you might have corresponds to what's going on uh, in a more documented uh, so systematic fashion. Right, so being able to take these data as an early indicator of a problem is one thing. And what we call, we use this data for situational awareness. Is there a problem that's potentially emerging? We really rely, we call this event-based surveillance. Is there something happening or not? It's quite binary in a way. Taking that data one step further to estimates of, of burden, um, to estimates of case number, that's another thing. And I think that's an ongoing effort to see whether these data, for instance, the discussions of individual illness on Twitter can actually be used as an estimate of illness. So far, that's a very difficult task. And uh, I would say, you know, we're still at the early stages. But so for instance, something like Google Flu Trends, um, or actually now we have a tool called Google Dengue Trends, does actually provide an indicator of potentially the severity of a season. Now, could you um, extrapolate that to case number? I think, I think that's where we have to be very careful about not overcalling the data. Okay, and, and uh, let's go back and talk a bit more about what you just mentioned of the experience in Haiti. Haiti had a substantial cholera outbreak. How did that show up as, as tweets and, you know, or, or did it just show up as a phenomenon and, and then somebody had to put the pieces together? Who, and who's putting those pieces together? <laughs> well, I mean, there's a lot of efforts that were ongoing during the time of, um, of, of cholera in Haiti. One was that we were just trying to build a map um, of, of risk based on the individual reports we were getting from the field. As you can imagine, you know, a fragile public health infrastructure was basically gone at the time, and to be able to, to create some form of surveillance was, was quite difficult. We actually collaborated with physicians on the ground to think about new ways of reporting in case information um, to create essentially a makeshift surveillance system. When we realized that that data was still probably not as extensive as we would have wanted to create a, a risk map of cholera, we essentially uh, expanded to, to using Twitter data. And very surprisingly, there was a lot of social media discussions that, was that were taking place at the time on the ground, mostly from NGOs and, and, and groups that were involved in, in the efforts um, to control the outbreak. Um, but it turned out that the volume of that activity on social networks, uh, the volume of mentions of cholera, was actually a very good indicator for how bad the epidemic was. Uh, I should say that it was good for the first couple waves of the epidemic. As you can imagine, people's interest in subjects goes away very quickly, and so from a long-term perspective, monitoring cholera from Twitter is not as good because people have moved on to the next important subject. So when there's heightened awareness of a problem, these, these tools can be extraordinary. When the problem go, goes away or it less in the, say, the news media eye, then we see less of the value of these data. All right, so I, I, I want to pursue this because I'm, I'm a little bit baffled as to <laughs> what exactly you were looking at when yeah. you, you know, you're using Twitter yeah. to follow a cholera outbreak. Right. Uh, so, so it wasn't so much the, the people, the Haitians themselves who were succumbing to this disease. It I mean, was there, a, there was a portion of that, but generally that wasn't, that wasn't what we saw. And, and so, the, so then there were, 
the, the many visitors, public health people right. and other others who came to the country to help with mm -hmm. help patients recover mm -hmm. from the earthquake were seeing that people were sick, sick. and then and, and, and they and were discussing. tweeting yeah. to their friends or to I mean their, it wasn't in in, and, a, in in a very serious way in terms yeah. of assessing the situation so it wasn't sort of a you know a you know, it, it, was a, it was a very serious discussion that was ongoing, but that volume of discussion, and we were just as surprised as you might be thinking about how that might translate to something that resembles an epidemic curve. But in general, the interest level and the discussions and people's activity talking about the situation and how severe it was did mimic very closely what, what we saw in terms of uh, case numbers and hospitalization data. And, and how are you scooping up this information? In so, what way do you do that? Is there like a keyword or? Right. So in, in that case, we were using a, a series of keywords, you know, around the term cholera. Generally, our system is looking for a whole range of disease terms, symptoms, uh, warnings, so environmental discussions that might lead to an outbreak. So we have a whole essentially taxonomy where we are essentially organizing content based on these types of classifications. So, and also around geography as well. So we're looking for particular mentions of of a country, a state, a province, a town, a, a street corner if possible. And we're organizing this sort of free text, this discussion, into actually a structured database. I see, but it, so the, the information analysis was, was based on the words that were in the tweets. Right, or in, in the this tweets. particular context, exactly. Do you, because one thing strikes me, that there is also, whenever people are not, always, I guess, when they're using Twitter, but there's also information embedded from the signal as to where they are, right? right. There's a location, right. as the sort of thing that some people are worried about as, uh, as, as something of a danger or risk to one's privacy. Right. But can you use Absolutely. that information as well? And are we you, do. And how do you go about acquiring that? So, so for people that use Twitter, um, or I guess people that don't use Twitter, essentially you have an ability to decide whether you want to add in location to the tweet. So you have, that's a, something you can decide on. Whether you want to, if, especially many people use their mobile phones when they use Twitter and other social network sources. So that, they can so essentially attach the GPS position to that tweet. It's a very small fraction of, of tweet, tweets that have that location, but even that small fraction is a valuable piece of information. So we have actually have a project with Penn State right now called CrowdBreaks, where we're mining all the, the Twitter data that has a location attached, and even that is in the millions of tweets a day. So in fact, even just using that small piece of data is actually allowing us to monitor discussions and, and concerns about diseases in communities across the US. I see. and and. But in that, I would think, jumble and flood of information, you can tease out what's, uh, what's medically related. Uh, I mean, you don't have trouble. Well, that's where. I would think <laughs> that, that you know, most of, that, of those yeah. conversations Absolutely. would be about what people are eating or I mean, you, you'd who's be, cute. And you'd be very surprised the things that come up in our system and that are hosted on our hospital server. Um, although I probably shouldn't say that because we're live right now, but the no, we want you. <laughs> if but, you do it to them, why why shouldn't we do no, it to but, you? No, but 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 in all reality, there's a lot of discussion that comes up as potentially um, disease related that is absolutely not, and that's when the machine learning efforts that we're involved in come into play. So. We have efforts, for instance, interns that sort of sit there and manually tag tweets. Is this a disease outbreak? Is this something, this is Bieber fever? Is this, you know, and, and going back and forth. And, and, and basically, based on that training set, then you can essentially prospectively start bidding uh, tweets into relevant and not relevant. And so you can create algorithms to look at the context and the words that are used, the sentence structure, and you can make those kinds of determinations automatically. Of course, it's not 100%. Sure. Um, but, but we're developing those algorithms that sort these kinds of things out. But the shocking thing is that some of the algorithm is a bunch of graduate students and interns who are oh, sorting yeah. through this information. I mean, right now we have a project. I mean, I, 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 uh, 
anyways, once again live, but I feel bad for certain students that are out there that are essentially spend a summer just tagging things as, and then we're doing this a lot in the, in the rumor space, and this is a whole other subject. So one way that we're conducting surveillance is to essentially look for early, you know, early detection of outbreaks in populations. But as you can imagine, the other half piece of it is there's just a lot of rumors and discussions and concerns about public health intervention. And that's just as important to monitor as disease risk. So there's a lot of discussion, as you can imagine, about uh, rumors around vaccines and conspiracy theories and issues about um, the government and, and corporations involved in, in vaccines that may not be useful to the population. And we can monitor the, those rumors as they bubble up. And so right now we have a project on HPV um, where essentially a student is, is sort of ma manually deciding is this you know, a negative tweet or a positive tweet about the HPV vaccine and then we can perspectively monitor and we can look at spikes like for instance um, Michelle Bachman coming out uh, against it, all of a sudden we get a, a spew of negativity around the HPV vaccine and you, we can monitor in real time the sort of attitude around issues in, in vaccines. So that's one other area that we can focus on. Well, that, that's fascinating. So if, if you, you plot a phenomenon of, of how the public reacts to what a politician might say, mm -hmm about a vaccine, and you then can extract more than just patterns of response, but some sort of trends about attitudes. Absolutely. The it's yeah. really interesting, but where, where <laughs> on earth do you publish that, that, those findings? Uh, how, do you, how do you handle <laughs> that? Uh, because it is a rather peculiar way to monitor public attitudes about vaccines, which is a very important yeah. part of the public health panorama, yeah. but it, it's not a very conventional it's approach not, it, to it. It's taken time for some of the more mainstream journals to be interested in this topic, but over time, I mean, the, the top journals have published ours and others work in this space, and so, yeah, I mean, it's become a critical, I mean, that, inf that information is out there, and so for us not to be harnessing it, using it, and understanding and how to counter, say, for instance, misinformation, I think people are recognizing this is an important piece of science. It, it seems as if it would be, but it would also be valuable, I guess, for people running election campaigns and sure, the, other things. The same tools that we're using to monitor issues around public health interventions are the same ones that, you know, that people are using to, to be able to call the U.S. election you know, ahead of time based on, based on people's attitudes towards the candidate. So it's very similar concepts. Okay. Now, I, 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 I'm kind of interested in exploring uh, a bit more with you, the, the way, the approaches you can take to, uh, to, to evaluate the, the data that yeah. you accumulate, yeah. because it seems as if that's a really important component of, mm -hmm. of what you're doing. It's, you're, you have a very, have very serious goals, mm -hmm. but you're monitoring kind of the trivia of human life uh, <laughs> at the moment, the electronic well chit-chat that goes along, uh, goes out and goes around. And, and so is, is, are there external ways for you to begin to validate Absolutely. your findings or do you have to do it all internally by using your interns to say this goes on the garbage pile yeah. and this goes on the rumor pile no, and yeah. this goes on the... We, we, we need, um, you know, gold standards to evaluate our data and that's a, a, key, a key part of the research we're involved in. Um, we're involved in a number of different efforts to validate our data. So for instance, we're, we do a lot of work in dengue right now, and what we've seen is that um, when we work closely with the CDC trying to evaluate is our data about dengue um, valid compared to say, for instance, what the yellow book, the, the, the official maps of, of dengue risk are around the world. Now, what happens is that those maps get out of date very quickly, and then we have real-time data. So on one hand, our data is potentially useful because it's showing the sort of moving boundary of dengue risk around the world um, way ahead of time. And that's why we actually have a collaboration on the CDC website. But what we can do is essentially look forward in time and say, okay, now the new Yellow Book data just came out. Um, what did, were we able to predict what that new boundary was going to look like based on our data? And that works quite well from a sensitivity specificity perspective, although we do call areas that we think have transmission of dengue that still are not in the yellow book. So 
our sensitivity measures are quite good. We, you know, it, when there's an outbreak that was eventually determined by the, the WHO or CDC, we almost always have captured in our system. The specificity is, is a little bit difficult because the gold standards that we rely on from the CDC and WHO are much more limited. And so, you know, we have over a million different outbreaks in our system over the last six years. The WHO... A say, million different outbreaks in general, right? In Not of dengue. No, no, in the yeah. world, yeah. Of, 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 of all sorts yeah, of diseases, of all sorts. right. But yeah. that's, you know, that's 10, 100 times fold greater than, say, the events that are in the WHO database. So from a validation standpoint, we, we can say, you know, you know, we can quantify the timeliness and sensitivity the specificity becomes much trickier because not everything makes its way up into official sources. But we're, we're, we have a lot of collaborations with WHO and CDC and local state departments of public health where we're trying, we're trying to get at the validity of the information. And you're, you're trying to do this not only on a national but a global basis. Yes. Let's see how to ask this question without starting international fracases. But there must be some some countries that we you know we hear about this from time to time through the newspapers and all where they they want to suppress information mm -hmm. about Absolutely. outbreaks how do you, how are you dealing with those kinds of challenges uh, are you are your information i would think would penetrate penetrate mm -hmm. th some of those barriers, but... Uh, absolutely, because they're coming through informal channels. Yeah. We're getting data that is not necessarily through the official means, and this is actually built into the international health regulations now that the WHO uses to essentially, they can essentially perform an investigation of outbreak or, or look into an outbreak without actually using the formal channels. Um, so yeah, so our data sort of surpasses that, and, and sometimes it can be tricky. I mean, we recently got a you know, message from a doctor in India talking about a chikungunya outbreak where the government had yet to de declare a chikungunya outbreak and was calling it something else. And so what do you do with that information? That's, we get into a tricky point where we're getting information ahead of when, say, a Ministry of Health is calling that, and what do we do with it? Of course, we just pass it, we, you know, we put it up, I mean, we put it out, we, we pass it along. We're not a, a response arm, so we sort of let the people that have that mandate uh, take on that information. But we, we have an iPhone application, or an Android and iPhone application called Outbreaks Near Me where people can report directly to the phone, uh, and, and we collect that information so there's, and they can bypass the whole sort of um, traditional flow of data through the healthcare system and, and public health and infrastructure. And so people all over the world are glomming onto those, those apps and, well, and using yeah. them in such a, well, we have or, about, or is this yeah. more a specialized population of people who are public health minded and maybe in the profession yeah. and, and want, don't want to be constrained as much as their governments might want to constrain them? Generally, I would say, I mean, we have um, over a half million downloads of the app. Um, generally, it's um, public health minded, clinical. I mean, there's also um, just people that are scared of infectious disease that are using the app as well. But, and we have a lot of general population, but, but for the most part, it's public health professionals that are they're using the app as a tool to stay up to date with information they might not know about, but then also report through. And, and does that interdigitate with, say, some of the other, the, the, the outfit in Canada and, and the, you know, the, I, I'm sorry, guys, but <laughs> I, I, I'm trying to remember. It's, 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 it's called GFIN. G, okay. Yeah, we, we essentially have a community of groups that are doing this kind of work around the world. There's a group in Canada and, and uh, there's the systems across the world, Japan and EU, that are doing this kind of work from a different perspective. We have sort of a, a consortium of these systems and we pass along information between the groups. Um, so absolutely, there's, there's, there's significant collaboration. Okay, well, that, that's really fascinating. Now, I did, when you were using terms sensitivity and specificity, and I thought I would circle back to the, to the earlier, you know, the, the subject matter of the earlier ICAC Live, which is H3, was H3N2 influenza. And that would be, it seems to me, an example of whether your sensitivity is up to the task. Do you, do you pick up on that outbreak, which is at 300 confirmed, mm -hmm. 300 plus confirmed cases yeah. now, pretty low right. numbers, and, and the symptoms of flu are pretty general, could be easily right. 
taken for those of a cold, at least in the early stages. So did, what, what, what was your experience yeah, with in that? In general, these, um, the, these events that are, that are in low case numbers or very difficult to sort, of, um, to sort of rise above the baseline are probably difficult from our system. They're difficult for a lot of the surveillance systems. If you looked at any sort of clinical data stream like emergency department visits, you're probably not going to see that signal rise, you know, rise above the sort of general baseline respiratory conditions. So I don't think we're at the point where H3N2 has sort of come above. I mean, so, so our systems sort of have the same issues as other surveillance systems, which is there's a baseline level of activity in these uh, influenza-like conditions, and you do need a significant number of cases to be able to see that signal. All right, so you're not seeing something like 300, but you might with a foodborne illness where the numbers are also low, but it's potentially sort of more pops clustered. Up. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's a, so there are, are some. How do you go about fixing that to try and? It's it's difficult. I mean, yeah. these systems. I mean, as people adopt these tools more, of course, if we have enough people in the systems, we'll be able to catch these things. So it's a matter of sample size in a way. We, we run a project called Flu Near You where people are putting in weekly, um, their symptoms on a weekly basis. And we have about 10,000 people in that system. Um, if we can get that system to a million people, then of course, you know, we're getting high resolution data on geography, age, demographic factors, and, and specific symptoms. At that point, we could be in a position to be able to detect these very small signals, these shifts uh, that happen at the population level. How do you acute, uh, 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 recruit a million, I guess you need a, a million, maybe several hundred thousand people in the rest are androids. <laughs> right, help, I mean, there, this. we got to get, yeah, we got to do it, figure out the incentives. I mean, right now, you know, we're, we're going from this perspective of putting the public back in public health, how to get people more energized about being part of the public health infrastructure, not necessarily having their data being siphoned off into, into some database where they've never, and they'll never see it, but actually get some feedback. I report in the system, I'll see what's happening in my community, I can make better decisions for my family, and so trying to do a better job of providing immediate feedback to the population as opposed to make it a one-way flow of information. Hopefully that's enough incentive. If not, uh, we can think about coupons to CVS or Walgreens, but, but for now it's, I, it's, oh, it's yeah. based on altruism. I was thinking in terms of chicken soup and a nation of, of yentas. Right. <laughs> well, that would work health, too. Public health concern yeah. yentas. Um, with no, I'm not casting aspersion. I don't mention gender there, but I do hope you come up with something. I mean, it, it, it is an odd thing because at some level, then you, you risk having the, you know, the people who are crying wolf rather right. than providing you valid data. So mm -hmm. there's the crossover point, I well, bet, is difficult. Yeah, hypochondriacs are our primary consumer, so we <laughs> want to make them happy, but, uh, <laughs> but definitely it'd be better to get a broad population sample. Okay, okay, well, I, I wonder, do we have any questions in the room or any internet, quizzical internet people? This should be right up your alley, folks, if you're using, use your Twitter accounts. We, ha we do have somebody in the room. <laughs> somebody who we know is wired, she's very wired. So, um, Marin McKenna from Wired. Uh, just a little bit more on what you were just talking about. It, is there any, when you make the, let me start that sentence again. When, when you make the shift from systems like Health Map, where you are essentially just eavesdropping on people's conversations yep. to each other, and you transition from that to a system in which people are, are speaking to you, are motivated to give you data, mm -hmm. is there any kind of inherent bias in that? Um. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's pros and cons to relying on, on, on both types of data. Well, I mean, there's going to be bias in terms of just the types of people that use the system, of course. You're switching from the, t you know, the conversations that happen online are a different type of population from ones that are reporting to us. The real benefit to the direct reporting, of course, is that we're getting structured data. So people are picking from a list of symptoms. They're telling us if they've gone the vaccine. They, they, they're giving us much more detailed information, which I think, of course, improves our ability to look at things. When we're eavesdropping on conversations, there's, we, we're not building the context for why those conversations occurred. And so we have no sort of basis for sort of understanding sort of a baseline or, or, or details about that individual. So I think we're, we're actually seeing 
hopefully, it, you know, you've got this trade-off because you've got a much smaller sample size that's doing the direct reporting versus a much larger sample size just tell, giving us whatever they want. And we haven't really done a deep analysis of what, that, what the data looks like between those two systems. Um, but that's definitely an important part is, you know, as we say transition for what people search for on Google, say like Google search, flu trends where it's a set, you know, key terms of fever and, and, and cough or thermometers, is that going to generate, and that generates something because it gives us an epidemic curve, but what we're really interested in is, is understanding at a much deeper level um, an influenza epidemic, for instance, and you're not going to get that kind of data from, say, search terms or, or potentially Twitter, but that's yet to be seen. Um, am I making a huge assumption that the sort of people who do the, <clears throat> the altruistic direct reporting are they likely to be healthier in many because they're they're health yeah. people or public health people? It, it, it's I mean I guess that we can we can sort of look at that and see um, on a weekly basis twenty percent of the population uh, in flu near you report some symptoms. I don't know if if that what that looks like compared to the population at large or you know one in five people sick on any given week. That seems actually on the higher side to me, but you know, I have no reason to say whether that's you know, what that looks like compared to baseline. Um, so we definitely get a lot of symptoms. I mean, are people more motivated to report their symptoms, you know, uh, you know, to, to make up symptoms? I mean, these are all the inherent biases in the system that we have to, to, to deal with. The whole self-report concept does raise a lot of issues in terms of people accurately understanding what, what they're going through. Um, but it, it's, you know, I think understanding how, this, how that data looks like to the general population is one area of important research. The other thing is, in some ways, it, how important is that if we're just looking for sort of looking at these data as an early signal, as the canaries in the cold mine, it may, may or may not be as critical that that population looks like the general population. Just to add a a kooky idea here, it would be great then if you could vaccinate them too, right? Well, that's it. I mean, we ask people to get, um, I mean, we ask people whether they've gone the vaccine every week and sort of as a stimulating the conversation of people trying to think about getting vaccinated, we ask that question. You mean the people who feed information to you, yeah. you're, you're, at, you're quizzing them about their... Whether they've had the vaccine, because then we can start uh -huh. estimating vaccine efficacy. We can look at coverage estimates oh, wow. based on this particular sample size. We can see sort of differences in, in vaccine coverage in real time, where that data often takes a long time before it's made available. But you can't yet vaccinate them through your system. No, we can't. You can't, can't deliver that vaccine. We can with send a them to the places. We, we run the vaccine okay. finder for the country, which means that we can send them, tell them where they, the closest va place to get a vaccine, how much it's going to cost. But no, yeah, we can't deliver Only it. Only if they have their location signal right. on it. Right, exactly. Guess, right. Okay. Well, I think uh, let me offer you a, a, an opportunity to, you know, a final comment, something <laughs> else that you'd like to share, and then we probably should close things down. But uh, any, any yeah. further thoughts? I mean, I think that generally social media um, has you know, two major roles, which is the idea of, of put it, pushing out information. And, and I think generally public health needs to do a better job of, of getting the message right. Um, you know, we've been focusing quite a bit on the second piece, which is um, how do we harness information that the communications that are taking place from a point of view of, of, of surveillance. But I think the messaging also has to come into play and thinking through the ways in which um, public health messages come through and get reacted to is, is a critical area of research. What we find, and of a colleague, Marcel Salafé at Penn State, he's found that any amount of communication uh, generates negativity on the part of the general population. And I think the idea of how to perform messaging in a way that generates more positive attitudes towards, say, vaccines or other public health measures is, is, is just as critical as our, our ability to harness that information for population health surveillance. Okay, very, very interesting. So I want to thank my thank guest, John Brownstein of Harvard Medical School. Uh, I want to remind those of you who are still watching us, that this is the last of the ICAC live sessions for the 2012 meeting of ICAC, uh, which is an American Society for Microbiology annual meeting on infectious diseases. This year from San Francisco, next year from Denver, as will be the ASM general meeting in the spring. Uh, I'm Jeffrey Fox, the features editor of Microbe, your host for 
a number of these sessions. I want to thank you for joining us and uh, invite you to join us next time around. Thanks again. Explore the fundamental role of microbes in the natural history of our planet with Microbes in Evolution, the world that Darwin never saw. Available at eStore.asm.org.